So welcome everyone to those of you here in Bendigo in person with us, but I know there's plenty online as well. I just want to acknowledge that we are meeting on Jar Jar Kurung country and some of you may be on Tongarong or Yorta Yorta land or even further afield and to pay our respects to elders past, present and future. So I'm Kerry Anderson. For those of you that haven't met me yet, I'm with Startup Central Victoria. And uh, the exciting news is we are continuing for another two years under a new consortium. Uh, and it's very exciting. So we can continue these events uh, into the future. Um, check out our website if you want to keep up or subscribe to our newsletter uh, so that you can keep in touch with some exciting events next year. I'd like to thank La Trobe Innovation and Entrepreneurship for partnering once again with us on this event. Lauren has done a fantastic job organising behind the scenes and right with them, Andrew Brown, um, who's ventured out into regional Victoria and I believe had another meat pie on upon arrival. <laughs> so he's, he's touring the region town by town and tasting the meat pies because you can't get them in Belgium. Cannot get meat pies. All right. So as you will have read in Andrew's uh, bio, his career has um, spanned sea level positions in global corporations. And he's been involved with numerous startup scale ups, playing investor, advisor, and C level roles. Well, before we even get, I'm still in the introduction. I have to ask a question. Nice. What C level mean, Andrew? CEO, 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 that sort of stuff. Okay, simple. When yeah. you know all yeah. these abbreviations, I have, I, I'm the one that asks all the <laughs> dumb questions in this. So, despite being based in Belgium, and delivering his sessions online. Andrew was one of our very highly regarded presenters in the first two accelerator programs that we ran during the year. So when he offered to come to Bendigo, we said, yes, please. But there's the next question. Why are you living in Belgium? I've been there 15 years. So it's, um, I went over there as part of a, uh, of a big corporate expat program. And just stayed, went from big corporate to startups and I Google all along in between and then Google to startups and you kind of set up a bit of a life there. So over the 15 years, getting back in the next two, three years, which I've been saying for the last 15 years. Yeah, but you're coming for the meat pies. I'm coming, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> it has, it is a, it's got a tug, it's got a tug at the heart. It's wrong, it's wrong the dimmies. But you usually bet you might, but big pies, that's the first one. I Absolutely. Think. All right. So when you said you could come and spend some time with us, um, you asked us what topic we'd like to speak up. One that's very close to my heart is scaling up. And uh, I noticed you called it how to scale you, which is very interesting when we're talking about business and startups, you've actually focused on you. So that's a sense of hint there. Uh, now, you have prepared some slides to keep me on track, or is it you, one or both. both of us? Um, talk us through what are we going to cover in this um, session? Yeah, so it's firstly great to be here for those in person, those remote. Um, for those remote, shout it out, shout out the questions. We're going to run this as a chat, not as a presentation, so you let's make it as, as interactive as possible. This is purely a guiding point to say, look, what are some of the things that we'll cover off today? The reason um, I think the scaling topic is really interesting is I, I face it myself every day. It's actually really a real challenge. I don't find it that easy. When you start up a company, you're pretty passionate about it. You get really boots and all into the, into the process. When you're scaling, things change. There's a lot of experience in this room, actually. Some of you guys I've spoken to over the last even 12 months, shout out your, shout out your examples as well because it's extremely relevant. But in terms of some of the things we'll touch on as almost discussion points. It's first of the challenges, why it's, why it's tough in the first place. Some of the stages you, you typically go through, 
generic, but most of us face it at some point. You can leapfrog certain bits and come back and reverse in certain times, but the wild trodden path typically. And then looking at some of the key ingredients for scale. Now, this is my position. I'm not taking this from a theoretical standpoint. It's what I live every day. So it's my view. I want you guys to challenge it and throw out your own examples and other, and other views on the topic as well. But in essence, looking at firstly how you define the grand plan. So what, what defines you as a company? What, what, what do you stand for, basically? Then your personal brand. Now, I'm not a marketing guru by any stretch. I, I've got really good people who do this sort of stuff. It's not me. Uh, but I've been educated on this more and more, more the last few years, the importance of personal branding, what it means to your company, actually, and how it really allows you to, to almost redefine yourself. Then the go-to-market the go -to engine. So that's a whole topic in itself. That's, that's, a, the, that's a subject for weeks of discussion. So we'll just summarise it in this case. But really, what does it mean? How do you build something which... Scale when you're asleep. And that's really the key thing we discussed a bit in, in the past. And then alignment. So alignment is something I'm pretty passionate about. It's what I typically do with, with the companies I'm involved in. Uh, and it's interesting being an Aussie, Aussie living in, in Europe particularly, because the, way, the one characteristic I think we have in spades is resourcefulness. Aussies are pretty resourceful. And it's, it comes down to location. You're pretty remote. You, you, you tend to do a lot of things yourself because you don't have massive teams and landlocked countries and those sort of things. So the alignment aspect really kicks into that. What does it mean to, to align, whether it's for exit or whether it's for, for growth scenarios or whatever else? And then some practicalities. Now, in amongst this agenda, we're going to have, just as I said, a fireside chat. We're going to talk and throw ideas around and learn that way, basically. So that sounds like a challenge. We, we can divert his attention from what's on the slide yeah, and please. lead him down the garden path. <laughs> and I will also acknowledge we've got Marty Barlow with us here too from ANRA Scales in the Masson, beautiful Masson Ranges. We've got a lot of people from the Masson Ranges tonight, so we're going to have a chat with him yeah, later on too. Yeah. Okay, so everyone, collective knowledge base, throw your ideas in. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Okay, I, I guess... Leading out there, and again, for those remote, please shout it out on, on the chat as well. One thing to start things off, what does scaling mean for everyone? Because it means different things to different people, depending on which perspective. So give us some ideas. What, what does scaling mean for the individuals here? Initial customers through to uh, obviously projected target numbers, that sort of stuff. Yep. Start to going in an upward spiral of idea. Yeah, I like it. Any other thoughts? Scaling? It's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And, and how quick, quick, quickly, that, you know, that sort of stuff. Yep. It's really interesting to me and why I'm interested in this topic is that um, you see this startup, it has such potential and you think it is going to go gangbusters mm. global. And then it just stagnates. And um, so, you know, it, it is, it's scary. And obviously that's one of the blocks that we're going to talk about today. But, um, you know, and, and also the definition. Some people choose not to scale up for life, lifestyle on. reasons. Whole range of things. Spot on. Yeah, fully agree. And that, that's sort of, it's a bit of a leading question because you know, we talk scaling and everyone looks at unicorns and they, they look at these these. These companies that go from zero to billions of dollars or, or euro overnight. Scaling is different things to different people. There's absolutely nothing wrong with starting a company because you just want to leave a legacy or you want to have a good lifestyle or you're passionate about something. You've got no intention to exit. Absolutely fine. Actually, fantastic. For other people, it does mean I want to start this thing. There's a gap in the market. I want to exploit the gap and I want to exit this thing in three years. Also good. So almost you come down to the grand plan as well. But scaling means different things to different people for good reasons because they've got to align with you, your lifestyle and all, all those sort of things. And, and to Kerry's point, it can be pretty bloody hard to scale. You've got a lot of realities of you know, you're, you've got to pay the bills this month and if you're 100% in it, that, that becomes a, a focus or an obsession and there's, there's a lot to, lot to contend with. So as I said, there's no right or wrong approach. It's just a matter of the company and, and the intent and the aspiration. One thing which is absolutely critical, and this is where when my sort of sidetrack role and the, the reason I love, I love getting involved in, in the Latrobe 
gang and, and startup Vic and stuff like that is I get to experience real people doing real things. And for my a founder myself, that's fantastic because you'll learn from those discussions. But in terms of the, the founder, it's pretty exciting because you are the, the crucial point. You are the liaise point. You are what everyone, you are synonymous with the company itself. You, you are the DNA. So when it comes to early engagement with customers, you can't outsource that. They want to deal with you directly. A customer will only feel comfortable if you automatically are the person that they can liaise with. So the thrill of the hunt is one thing that a lot of founders find quite invigorating, myself included. I love that stage. You know, you're closing the deals personally. You're seeing the actual impact of what your new product or service does in real terms, in actual engagement with the customers. It's awesome, but it doesn't scale too well. And this is a personal challenge for me, to be frank. Individuals that uh, have different skill sets at different times in the company, and we'll sort of get into this a bit. But this whole, what do they call it, um, founderitis or whatever else, on a whole lot of different cliche terms, but it's real. So you're the most important per person or people in the early phase, particularly in the sales process, but something's got to give at some point. Unless, again, you just you want to have a really good life where you are and you want to just run, run it as the sole contributor. So, Andrew, I, I interview a lot of entrepreneurs and there's no doubt they're a, a, a level above just a good business person. Yeah. They are driven. They've got this vision. They are absolutely focused on what they want to achieve. Are they the worst ones when it comes to founderitis? Yeah, they are. And again, from personal, personal experience, it, it, can, it can be pretty um, chaotic early on. You become a jack of all trades because you, you need to do everything. You need to be, you do the photocopy. <laughs> you, you, you organise the next meeting. You organise a catering for your customer visits. You've got to do everything. And a lot of founders like that business. So they like to be, they like to be 100, 110%, 120% full. It's hard to let go, actually. And one of the, the biggest challenges is when you start onboarding for certain skills, being prepared to let go enough to say, actually, that person may not do it the same way as I, I would do it, and that's okay. Or from a pure commercial standpoint, I'm going to onboard a sales source. My productivity automatically goes down around about 20%, automatically. Because I've got to give up time, you've got to onboard the person, they're not going to start you know, smashing it out, out of the park from day one. So actually, the hockey stick starts to starts to go down a bit. You've got investors breathing down your neck or just the, you know, you need to pay the bill next month or you want, to, you want your p and to look awesome. That's tough. You've got to be prepared to accept that, that reality. So to answer your question, absolutely. It is very driven people. And the, the founders I gravitate towards are 100% focused. They are driven, they know what they want, they're single-minded, they, they don't deviate. They deviate at the right times, but they don't, they're not apprehensive in making moves. And they have to know when to let go at the yeah, right time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that can also be this this nice little segue. This this point. So is a founding is a founding team actually the right people to drive it to the next level? Now this is talking well and truly beyond scale, but you know, often in companies, there is that tipping point. What, what leads to an awesome startup, a founder that really can drive and, and break through walls and things, you suddenly get into the 50 people, 60 people, 70 people, 100 people, and the realities of that company change dramatically. You suddenly talk, start talking hierarchy. You need to add process to the way you do things. You need framework. It can't, it can't be ad hoc anymore. And some founders find it really tough because they're not built like that. They're built for the adrenaline kick. Um, you've seen recent examples in the tech, I'm mainly in high tech, recent examples in the high tech industry, firstly, where they were seriously overcapitalized, but also where smart founders have stepped out. They've, or they've, they've, stepped, they've stepped to the side or they've gone into, into the board or whatever else, but they've handed over the reins on, of the CEO and other COO sort of roles to people that had more framework and sometimes aren't as emotionally attached. If you're too emotionally attached, it's kind of hard to see the forest of the trees. 
and time and time again, that um, proves to be profitable. Um, I know I interviewed Bruce Symes from Vets All Natural, and he hung on, hung on, and eventually handed over the reins to a, a general manager and tripled tripled his profits. Yeah. He said, should have done it years ago. <laughs> so, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, absolutely. You're not always the right person. And he still had a role to mm. play as a spokesperson, but not doing the, the general managing. Yeah. You know. Thoughts? Remote as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you feeling a bit? Is anyone oh, feeling healthy? Yeah. yeah. I am, yeah. So we're in, I'm in the middle of that right now. Yep. Let's go. So this is a big therapy session just for you. <laughs> this is your safe place, mate. It's a safe place. Uh, yeah, it is. It's handing over and letting it. You know, letting it go to the others. Yeah, but it's you can't. We're at a point now where it, it, it has to happen. Otherwise, we just like you say, we just leave it as it is for the minute. We can't run like it is, or if we keep doing what we're doing, then it's got to let go. It's plenty. It's, it's letting go, but it's also plenty of your strengths. Mm. Yeah, and I think the, the best, the best lesson that I've personally learned is knowing, learning my strengths and my weaknesses. So when when I was growing up. You learn your strengths, you know your strengths pretty 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 obvious, but you also know your weaknesses. And you spend a lot of time focusing on your weaknesses and, and improving those weaknesses so they become on par. But a very wise person said to me about five to ten years ago, why do you keep focusing on your on your, your weaknesses so much? Your strengths are okay. Focus on those, because they're the things which will actually define you. It doesn't mean you stop stop working hard on, on other things, but in my experience, that people they can do those things much better than I can. And that's sort of part of the journey that I've faced at least, um, where I kind of know when it is time to let go of it, the appointment. So, Andrew, you, you're at this point. You know you've got to do something. Yeah. It's, um, you know, if you want it to succeed but you don't know how to go about it, who are the people you need to get around the table with you to make an informed decision? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. It comes down to, we're going to talk about on alignment in a second. Um, it's a pretty lonely job being a, a founder. And if you don't have that mentorship or advisor or just frankly sounding board, I think mentorship's a bit overdone at times because a mentor will only come from a, from a, a theoretical standpoint or their own standpoint. And I'm always really cautious to talk about, I, I'm talking from my standpoint. I'm, I'm not telling you how to do things because you know better than I do. But it's really good to have sounding board people, people that aren't necessarily as emotionally attached, but they've got a they've got a they've got a role to play. They've done it before, or they've they're affiliated with your industry, or they're well regarded. It's really important, I think, to have those sort of sounding boards. That's again where I love these programs. I I don't get involved in these programs too much, but the whole GMAP program, the Startup Victoria program, it's different. It's a different vibe to it. Actually, it's much more community-based, much more inclusive, and there's smart people involved as well. And as someone getting involved in those, you learn as much as you give. So I think it's really fundamental. Now, you can extend that further and say you've got to start thinking about things like a board, a board of directors early on. And I, I believe in that, actually, because depending on where you want to go with the company, your board of directors can be really fundamental in terms of your evaluation, your ability to scale your networking, all those sort of things. So that can also play that side role, but often a, a sanding board can be a little bit separated from the actual company because you almost want that separation. And then they can they can give more of a, a feel for things from a personal standpoint as well as business. So I, I, that's how I always done it. And, and with a, um, if you have an advisory board, you actually have an obligation to hand over your financials yeah. and really let them scrutinise it because otherwise how can they advise you? Absolutely. And um, it's certainly uh, a discussion point that we've had in the past mm. and I think a very useful one. Mm. I love the mentorship thing at the standing board because a board of directors or an advisory board, it's a left, it's official to an extent. So there's a, there's a certain expectation or company requirement. A sounding board or a mentor is not, you don't have that obligation. They can be part of the board, but often more, than, more often than not, they're looking out for the individual. So you go to them, not just for corporate or, or strategy or things like that, but also struggling right now. I'm just struggling with the next step in the company. I'm not sure where to take it. 
they're not they're not corporately attached they're emotionally attached it's a it's a better feel i, I like it more anyway it's it's information gathering but at some point you've got to analyze and make the hard decisions yeah. too yeah, well, yeah of course okay now this is as theoretical as this session session gets and this again is is Take it with a grain of salt. It doesn't sound on the exact science. But in terms of the way this, this founding journey goes, and to be honest, I've taken this from a, an earlier presentation I gave on investment. So the difference between seed investment right through to series A, series B, exit. There's a lot of commonality, though, in terms of stage and, and those sort of things. But the important element here is the percentage. You go from 100%, and that starts to ratchet down. To a percentage where you can't control at the same point so it's much more about what happens when you get the, the idea stage is all you 100 percent control see it's still kind of all you or mainly you. you're going to drive the vision i'm much more we talked about this as well i'm much more keen on identifying roles as opposed to people or or, or nice sea level positions for, the, <laughs> for that phrase before um because you want to control your equity you want to control as much as you can it only starts becoming a real tipping point when you move more into the scale-up stage. You've proven the MVP. You've got some money coming through the door. Might not be much, but more importantly, you've typically got uptake, some level of uptake. And then you start getting much more into roles need to change. The type of positions suddenly, which weren't even considered in C, become a reality for you. And you start to see the 50%, 50%. And then the next stage is kind of where you've got, you typically make a decision is it me driving the ship or is it someone else that's now and I hand over the reins to? And hence the hence the unknown aspect. Um, leading questions are tough in these environments, so I'm gonna but I'm gonna keep doing it anyway. <laughs> Any thoughts on this? Do you, do you agree, disagree, impartial to it? Own experiences. Agree to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then to some of the previous questions, the whole giving up things. So just through our discussion with over the last couple of years, growing pretty quick, although growing pretty quick. And it became at a stage where we about six months ago had to start giving up. I suppose the rain has been involved day in, day out, and start just kind of step back. Um we're probably at that scale of acceleration phase at the moment. And yeah, a lot of the founders have kind of, I suppose, stepped back. Excel's coming in to, to kind of really drive it. Sometimes. You had a good story, actually. Yeah. In terms of your problem is you got you got too much going on. Yeah. yeah. We've got, in a good way, though. Yeah. So we've got two kind of two businesses going at a consulting company, and then through the consulting company, we identify, I suppose, a, a gap in the market where we know consulting is going to go get to. Um, so we've had two businesses that focus on the, the consulting we've grown from two, there's 11 of us, I counted by that. I left them before. Um, you, you, you exaggerated a little bit, mate. You went, you went, you went well, 20. Well, <laughs> no, we want to get to 20. Oh, okay. 20 is our goal. Um, and we're using that, the, the consulting company to fund our actual platform business. Um, but we're at the stage now where the tides are tipping, I suppose, where we can start investing more time in the in the, in the platform and hopefully start moving resources in the platform business and only have the consulting as a this real high niche type of market. What industry? Cybersecurity. There's a real buzz in regional Victoria. I've been involved in actually some of you guys for about a year. And to see the pivots and that resourcefulness that I, we talked about. You go to market strategies at sound. And, you know, I'm not sure who's on who's on remote, but um, it's really encouraging to be honest. And it's it's just it's hustle. It's hustle. It's kind of working through adversity, maneuvering around, and, and getting yourself into really good positions. So I think you, you're kind of able to to navigate around some of these challenges. It's a good story. So, the scaling thing. 
we got to the bottom of what scaling means in terms of individuals, how it really is an individual thing, depending on where you, your own aspirations. We talked a bit about the stages and some examples of that as well. What are the biggest challenges you're facing? Mine are exactly where I want to go. Yeah. Um, and which line essentially we choose to do. Um, so mine's a, an online uh, private uh, networking platform. Um, it's got a few different twists to it and changes to it and what's currently existing and what I deem irrelevant communication. Um, so that's that's one, exactly how we hone in on that. The second one, the biggest challenge is what determining exactly what is needed as far as staff and or money. Um, and third is actually if I want to go too quick versus actually keeping it nice and intimate and going that organic approach to keep it relevant because our, our whole basis is privacy and relevance. So, um, yeah, how we actually get to where we want to go and whether that means, you know, sourcing dollars and or handing over some equity or those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, it's just finding it, narrowing exactly to where I do want to take it and how we get there. But the thing that I was really impressed with, because we've been speaking again for a while, what I liked about our conversation was the focus. You've kind of tailored your, your positioning. So without stealing your thunder a bit, in terms of the, the connection point and the, 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 the overall SaaS proposition, it was pretty broad. And you've narrowed it down based on your own frame of reference, your own experience. And you're playing to your strengths as a result, you're you're suddenly more intimate with it because you know that you know the people that you want to engage with. That's smart. Smart way of you go to market is much, it's it's much sounder. Even if your 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 target market may be smaller, it's honed. So you, you can you can interact much quicker, much easier, and without the barriers that you would have gone would have faced if you went just mass. Smart way of doing it. So it's about controlling your pace of yeah. scaling is really critical to testing, finding this is working then and, and do you have a time scale that you're working to? Not necessarily, no. um, but um, yeah, obviously we want to just continue that up and spiral, know whether that's you know, what incline is, is um, yeah, debatable, but um, I'd rather do it with the right people rather than just yeah. mass and again, I, I'd like if you get too big, too quick, or too broad, it becomes irrelevant. Um, so that's why I'm really trying to, yeah, hone in as such. And and it's also, you know, um, I figured out that I couldn't do everything as well. So when I figured out what I could do, it actually sort of led me back down the path of what to control. Yep, makes sense. Any other thoughts on the scaling? Challenges? Back to what you said before about creating the roles rather than finding the person, I mean, find the right person, but that's our biggest thing at the minute is trying to find, trying to actually write the position, trying to find out what that position is that we need to fill so that we can go to the next level, keep doing what we're doing. Because if it's going to come away from me, obviously I've never had a position description for myself. Yep. So that's what we're trying to do at the minute, trying to, we're tossing up which roles, who do we need in there to be able to keep going to let, and let us, a couple of us step back. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm a real advocate for defining the, the gaps as opposed to, you see some often founders, founding members, it's, it's quite lonely. So they they have, they gravitate gravitate towards, I want a co-founder. I want a CTO, I'm going to give them equity. I'm going to bring someone on. It can work, but I think you need to almost step back and say, well, exactly as you say, what skills am I lacking? Lacking. What skills could I, could I, could be useful in, Upskilling or, or, or helping me go into different parts. And there might be different ways of actually getting those skills on board than necessarily giving up equity straight away. So I, I completely agree. Any thoughts from remote? Any uh, chat based question? Being very quiet. Yeah. We're, we're using the, yeah. the, the marvels of technology to our advantage. <laughs> I think um, another thing is, is thinking about. A skill that are going to bring the most benefit to you. You know, we all want a, a, a spiffy person doing this exact role, um, and, and you know the the modern company. But it's actually picking the roles 
they're going to bring the most value to your success and growth support. So prioritizing what roles to bring on first, what are the crucial ones as opposed to the really nice ones because you can't onboard everyone all at once, especially when you're still prizing that information out of your head, what you know, but also what you don't know. Okay. We're going to move on to some of the challenges. Broad list. In general, the agility starts to suffer. Agility is pretty amazing when it's you or a few other people, co-founders. You're pretty quick. You know what you're doing. You can you can pivot. You can move quickly. You can work weekends. All that sort of good stuff. Sometimes good stuff. Sometimes sometimes not so good. But you can do those things easily. You potentially lose lose some of that. You go from if some of us have a great process. I'm absolutely not one of them. You need process suddenly. You have more people on board. You've got more customers to deal with. You've got more product cycles suddenly in play. You need a process. You need framework. You need to suddenly start dealing with operations in a way that you didn't have to before. It can't just be all spare of the moment, knee-jerk reaction. And once you've got that process in place, you can actually go and fishing or on your holiday and do stuff good. like that because your staff know what to do. The processes are in place. Or come to Bendigo during the, the busiest month of the year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, your corporate culture. So corporate culture actually is really important. It's much more important than I think a lot of us give credit for. It defines who you are, not just internally, but how you're perceived to the market. Often the, the founder or the founding team, so that they are that corporate culture. They define it. The more people you bring in, of course, the more subject that corporate culture is to change. So maintaining it and really having a, a level of, you know, again, process, unfortunately, to ensure that it's maintained, having your vision statement, all that's good stuff, and living it by doing becomes really important, actually, because you, and it, it becomes even more critical when you start looking at multi-offices. One office you can maintain. You've got everyone in the same office. You interact together. You're in, in, you're in, you're, you have a coffee in the morning together, all those sort of things. Start going remote, start particularly going international, then it becomes a real challenge, a real challenge. So maintaining is really important. Hierarchies. By definition, most people are political in some dimension. Doesn't it be a bad thing? Of course, but hierarchies create a different flavor within the company, a different way of thinking, you know, a bit more of potentially fractions between individuals. So you've got to be aware of it and be pretty open to, to those realities as well. The expectations of employees, and I, I quoted before the 20%, that's pretty well trodden actually. You do lose productivity immediately. So scaling means more people, more people means you start to decrease your. Or, or, or at least reduce your productivity levels. Certain roles are more so than others. I know from a pure sales standpoint, six months is a standard for the, someone to really start selling, you know, start making back the initial investment. You need to be ready for that. Too often you see business cases or, or plans, corporate plans, which just say, I'm going to onboard the pe person in January. This is when the, the up, uptake starts. And it's not typically aligned with the reality of that about, about uh, onboarding process. Short term or long term, you know, some founders are unbelievable. They're also they, they're visionaries. They're, they've got a, a five term, five year, five year plan ahead of, ahead of them. They know where they're going. Others don't. They have that vision. They can drive things in the short term, but then migrating that to a longer term is a lot more challenging. And then finally, you've got to know your role. You're doing everything. What does it mean to be a CEO or a COO or whatever else it might be? You've got to define your role, to your point, before money. You don't have a job description. None of us do. It, it becomes important, actually. Your role becomes important. It becomes much more important to know where you, you do or you don't fit because the worst founder is the one who gets too involved. They don't let people do their jobs. You hire someone and then basically oversee them. You micromanage them. It's not a fun experience for your employees. That it doesn't bring a nice corporate culture. So that's a really important element. It's not just about transitioning. It's not just about doing all these good things. You've got to live by it as well. So if you make the call, you've got to live by that call as well. You've also got to set them up to succeed too. So you obviously got to give them that time where you 
bring their knowledge base up, invest in them, but then they can move on. Yeah. Yeah, which is this transition thing. Some people start and continue their role happily forever, ever, ever, ever in a day, ever in a day. You have founders like that. I'm not one, <laughs> to be honest, but you have people who, 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 who have those transitional skills. I've, I've listed a couple here, which I've faced, sort of at least their trigger point. So you validated the product and it's, it's, it's really MVP or it's actually beyond that. It's GA or, or general availability. You've got, you've got cadence around the product development cycles, whether it be a physical product or a SaaS-based service product. It's well, it's well prepared and gone from one to two to 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, that type of longevity or robustness. It's, it's, it's relatively standalone, so it doesn't need a lot of intervention. Um, now I'm talking a bit from a high tech standpoint. It, it works without any real global challenge. So you don't, it's operationally in a pretty, pretty good position. You've gone beyond your own, your own strengths that you can influence. Your sphere of influence is not as great as it used to be. You can't move the needle in the way that you did a year ago. You can still, you're still a figurehead and all those sort of good things, but you kind of recognise there are becoming individuals in your company that are probably more important on a day-to-day -day basis than potentially you are. And you typically reach a threshold point. Now, that's, again, as I said, grain of salt before, similar applies to five mil. Um, five mil is just normally a, a pretty decent rate for an investor to really start looking at this seriously as a, as a growing concern, as a, an MRR or monthly returning revenue type of business. Um, and the reason I say five is that's when you look at typically a series A, if that's where you want to go down. So you, you're established and you don't desperately need the investment, but it would allow you to grow much faster. What else have I missed? What have I missed on here? Transition points. Well, we had an interesting speaker back in um, April talking a little bit about scale up, and and I think I asked him the question: When when did you know it was the time to do something? He said when nothing was happening. Yeah, fair. fair. <laughs> he plateaued out, and he he talked about he had a formula about the growth um, and and how many employees and that mm. growth pattern. He put a lot of thought into it, but I was quite struck by that when nothing was happening, it, you know, no growth whatsoever. He said that was the time to really apply the scale. That's scale. impressive. That's, yeah. that's a, shows a level of maturity, actually. That was an excellent speaker right here in the region. Yeah. yeah. We've got a character in this room. We can talk a bit about scaling. Yeah, come and share your story. You can sit over there. Yeah, come, over come, sit, come and join us. Come and sit in the hot seat. Oh, now he's, he's feeling the pressure. Come <laughs> see. <laughs> Experiences, because I think your story is a pretty interesting one when it comes to scale. You've gone down a slightly different path, but it's made really, really interesting from when we first started speaking. So give, give a bit of a history. Well, we've got a business in the weighing industry with scales. You like that? You like that? You see what I've done there? <laughs> so, um, so we're not a we're not obviously you know going for global. You know, um, yeah, <laughs> domination. But where we saw a hole when we started in the market, in between in this industry that we're in, there was a bit of a hole. There was all, there was the big multinational companies, and then there was a lot of very small single person operator companies. And so we saw a hole to sit somewhere in the middle. Um, when we got started in 2015, and then in 2017, we purchased. Uh, business and then since then we've purchased another three. We just signed a contract last week to buy another business. So that's been our uh, way to expand and to grow. Getting guys, they're not necessarily booming businesses that we're buying, but they've got a good, we can pick them up and um, expand on what it is. Is there a kind of a criteria when, when you identify a company? Well, there is. It's sort of, it's obviously their, their, uh, what they do and their values, I suppose, are very similar to ours in terms of a lot of the stuff we're doing is in um, regional areas. Um, and 
it's just something that we can take on easily without, you know, with the people that we've got mm. so we can take it on. So it's got to be a good fit in terms of physically the service that we're providing. Yeah. yeah. I like the story because it's seriously informed. Like it's not just saying well, we'll just keep you owning it, we'll, we'll kind of we're good, we're making a good living. It's really saying we'll go after it. It's a risk, mm. educated risk. Yeah. But um, it's reaping the rewards. I like it a lot. Mm. Yeah. What's next? Well, we've got a few others. So, but we're just like I say, it's at the point now. So since the start of COVID, we had about four employees or something. Now we've got fifteen. Yeah. Another couple in start of January. So yeah, we're right at that point. The last little while it's just been that focus on yeah, trying to define the roles to see what it is that comes off me. And yeah. Have you had any challenges in terms of integrating the companies into that culture and to, to kind of ensure that they're not disparate? You've got one entity. That has been that has been tricky because we'll be opening the third branch in January. So that'll be even having two branches, like they're not too far away, or yeah. one's in Aubrey, one's in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, they're about that one in Ballarat. Uh, so there has been a bit of, like, I mean, we travel up and down the highway a lot, but there has been, um, yeah, it has been challenges trying to get, you know, everybody on board. We're actually just starting to have routine meetings. Those sort of things, we're getting a bit of external help with a few people that are recommending a few things. Yeah. So uh, I'll be going to these meetings every morning, so the most challenging i'm probably the most <laughs> challenging one to get there because i'm usually late so i'm not leading by example there but i think it's a good thing to get everyone on board so we get the guys from albury and we get the guys from melbourne to do the same ones yeah. so it's it's the difference in the culture between city and regional because you know they're, they're um you know the customers might be the same but the customers might be a slightly different culture is that reflected in the workforce too absolutely yeah yeah absolutely so we, we've got head office in melbourne it's mainly administration. All the we've got more guys up in Albury, and there'll be more in Ballarat as well. Like yeah. in terms of the workload, lot all of us prefer to work in regional. We don't do a lot in the city at the minute in terms of the service. A work, necessary we, evil, the city. <laughs> Just some little side of it. I like that. So, but yeah, there's plenty of work there to be in the city. I suppose the thing that we've done, we've sort of picked places where there hasn't been anybody else. Albury's halfway between. Melbourne and Sydney, so there's no one else in the area, mm. or not anymore. Not no, so we bought them out last year. There's no one else that does what we did in the area, and so now any competitors either going to come and set up or come from Sydney or Melbourne. Yeah, so, it's a grand plan to maintain, or is it to get to a certain point where you get a bit interesting for international, local? Yeah, look, it's always like I know I spoke to uh, an uncle of mine right when I got started in this. And he said, right from the start, you've got to build for sale. Yep. Build it for sale from yep. day one. So I guess that's what we've done, whether you know it's this thing, whether it's whether we sell up or my wife doesn't understand that. She says, What the hell are you gonna do if yeah. sell up? Yeah. <laughs> but uh I could think of a few things. Um, <laughs> but you know, like we're building it, it's it's good, it's good fun building it and yeah. doing it if if it comes along at some point. Um, yeah, but it's not, we're not for sale, but I still mm. assume you'd say we are building for sale. Yeah, smart. Yeah. How about you? But your role from a couple of years ago to now, how's that transition? Well, just I suppose that's the thing from those two years. It's, and this is what I'm seeing in terms of knowing that when you talk about knowing when to transition, I mm. think that's pretty clear now because two years ago, I was you know, more on the tools doing the things day to day mm. with the guys helping out. Whereas now you can't do it, and so there's things getting missed. So then, yeah. it's, so for me, it's you know, I'm, I'm primarily office based, pretty much on the road, mm. seeing people. But same thing, I I know where I'm best. I'm best out on the road. Yeah. Uh, not I'm not not necessarily on the tools, but out on the road, mm. um, which means I need yeah I need to fill those roles in yeah. the office. Yeah. So um, makes yeah, sense. That's the. That's the thing for us at the minute. I think, like you said about the mentorship, I reckon, yeah, call it what you will, whether it's a mentor. We've always got, I've always got two or three different people that I'm talking to external. Like, there's yeah. nothing better than external views. Not part, can have, well, not, part not, of, not part of the founding, just a complete, yeah. someone completely not yeah, involved at all. Yeah. How have you found those people? How do they like? Uh, professional. One got, one got recommended by. 
family accountant and just to, and that's probably when we really started to sort of, um, he was in regional Victoria as well and he just helped sort of kickstart things into, yeah, into, that was 2019. Um, and he said, yeah, just help me just look at things from a different, you know, look at things from a different way that we had before. Uh, and there's a couple that we're with at the minute. Um, one I actually found on LinkedIn. I like the stuff he was doing on there, so I reached out to him. And um, turns out he's in Ballarat, so that worked out well. Uh, and there's actually another. There's a program available, which I think we just we've started in a um, what's it called entrepreneurs program, which is a government uh, initiative, same thing. Um, and they come out and they spend 12 months like a growth roadmap. They say, and so you get you know. And so there's that part of it that someone will come out and spend time with you. Look at their book, at all the financials and everything, and then they come back with the report pretty soon. I've come back. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and then from that, there's funding and stuff you can apply for as well. So, that's interesting. I didn't, I hadn't heard that. So. Well, I didn't either. It was just the consultant that I'd spoken to. He said, give this guy a call. And yeah. Then, yeah. So, it's, it's a good thing they've come out. He's had several meetings with us, and they're, and they're you know, like you say, talking to someone that's completely external, that's giving the truth about what they're looking at, yeah. you know, the figures and, Different things that they look at. Mm. That's actually helpful. Yeah, so mum yeah. saying how beautiful everything is and it's nice and warm and fuzzy as it is, it doesn't help a great deal with the if growing what we're doing. So that's a good story. Good I might story. be jumping ahead a bit, but I'm really interested. Marty's doing all the work now. We're going to keep using it as a case study, but we're going to stop into the future here. So you're getting the right people on board, you're getting your processes in place. And you're putting yourself in the best position that you feel is right for you to lead that organisation forward. You have to keep your finger on the pulse, but how do you do that? How are you going to know without you know this micromanaging? Step back, but still keep you know. So, what are the processes that Marty could be looking forward into the future to manage that scaling and it may continue to scale up dramatically? But you know what, what? How does he know what's the best way not to micromanage, but still keep his finger on the pulse? Look, I'm really big on trusting the people I hire. To be honest, I, I see I'm involved in in other companies where I, I don't necessarily always see that. Um, I, I hire people on a principle that they can do the job that I hire them for probably better than I could. And if you don't give them the freedom, of, or if you don't give them the trust in in actually following through, through with that role, then it's really tough to scale in the first place. So in order to achieve that, though, you need to have worked out the criteria that you're looking for. That comes a bit down to the, the culture, the corporate culture you're trying to, to generate, but also just what's important to, to you and being pretty upfront about it in the first interview. So the scrutinising upfront and creating the right expectation and then just trusting. So you want... A really good manager, in my experience at least, takes away the red tape from the people doing their, their, their job. If you're micromanaging, you sort of, to me, you've already lost the you've already lost the battle. So that's a very simple philosophy, but I just trust the guys I guys and girls I hire. Hire someone smarter than you, Marty. Yeah, well, I've got to do that now. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Like you said, the processes, that's the thing. I'm not good. I know I'm not good documenting and processing like I'm a tradesman I'm not I don't you know I didn't concentrate very much at school in terms of yeah I hate all the document I don't hate it I, I'm not good at it yeah. documenting and processes and all the systems and all those sort of procedures and those sort of things but we've got people in there that are doing it now you need not exactly you need a really good operations person yeah I'm the same yeah. I, I it's one of the go-to roles for me actually mm -hmm. not a really good operations person because they live and breathe process and you've you do need it for a company. Yeah. Otherwise, things fall through the gaps. It's it's really easy for things to be forgotten about, or you didn't quite get there at the right time. And it's you need people to to feel but its role as opposed to sorry, it's its skill set as opposed to this is the role I want. Because then if you start to already predefine the role, it's much harder to fill it. Actually, you need a, to me. You need to work out the gaps in your skill sets in the company. And then you can work it out in, in various ways. You might use accelerators. You might use interns. You might use you know, outsourcing. It could be a lot of different ways, but you need to know the gaps first. 
Nice one. Good story. Feel, cool. You're feeling as if you've had that love, the feeling the love that. <laughs> <laughs> no, much much appreciated. You came up and shared that. No. Anyone else for an intervention? <laughs> Okay, so the um, the last little bit of this talks a bit about again some my experiences with the whole scaling aspect. So I have four points that I typically work on. It's firstly just defining that that grand plan, your vision for the company, and I'll go into that in a second. Your personal brand which sounds like a really strange one, but it's so important when you you're small and you scale and you want to scale. Building the go to market plan, which is a big big topic, but we, you can do it in very systematic, very stepwise ways. And you guys are doing it already, to be honest, um, which I've been really impressed with. And the alignment aspect. So, the one thing a lot of companies don't do is have a little whiteboard session with their co-founder or their core management team to work out what do we want to what do we want to be when we grow up? What's actually our plan? And it seems so elementary, so obvious. But often it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. Companies don't do it. They just get into the day-to-day -day and they don't actually work out where, we, where do we want to be. Now, if you don't know where you want to be, it's really hard to come up with a strategy to get there. The difference between I want to exit in three years or I want to sustain this thing for 10 years, I, just, I want to leave a legacy. The decisions you make will be fundamentally different. If it's exit, it'll be very tactical. It'll be really tactical. If you've got a three-year plan, you do things differently. You align with certain customer groups because you know you'll get a, a quick fix. If it's building something to, to hand down or whatever else, you don't make the same decisions because you've got the need for time. So the, 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 the grand plan part and really considering what that means once you've worked out your grand plan, what it means in year one, year two, year three. And in most cases, you can, you can get quite practical. There are typically key pillars of activity that you need to hit. And that field goes into a bit, bit of that gap filling as well. It's the marketing side of things. It's the sales and, 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 and go-to-market plans. It's a product. It's the operations. There might be the, the, the innovation layer. They're all, little, they're all columns. If you know your grand plan, you know your columns, the key activities you need to hit, then you can start getting pretty practical again with, okay, what do I, what do I need to hit this year in each of those areas? And you start whiteboarding that and you've got yourself a plan. In a night, you've got a plan. And you can refine it over time. It doesn't mean this is the only way you're ever going to go, but it does give you focus. It gives you direction. And that's really fundamental when you're scaling. If you don't know those things, if you haven't worked them out, you're leaving things a bit to chance, and that's never typically a great strategy. So it does take time. It does, it does take refinement, and it does take, it does take retaking, actually. You've got to look at this again every month, every two months, every three months. You need to review every quarter to really get this done properly. Yeah, so the, the, the action per pillar, though, can get really, really specific, and it does allow you to make... The decision is based on how much money do you have, what do you expect to hit, what are your milestones. You can then baseline, I'm going to hit this amount, if this, this, this happens. It was very interesting during COVID where we suddenly had a, a need for um, masks and, and uh, materials like that. So it was the capacity to build them and then, of course, distribution channels. So I guess that's always in the back of our mind. Can we produce, if we're marketing really well can we actually produce and and actually distribute it yeah, exactly. those channels so it's a bit of a juggling act isn't it and, and that capacity in terms of machinery if you need to produce or people if it's services or those platforms that can replicate it yeah you know and i think that the other reason this sort of planning element is really important is if you do ever have aspiration to exit or even to seek investment, you need to have this down pat. And the last point on the on the on the investment side of things or the financial planning, it's actually fundamental. You need to know your burn rate monthly. You need to know you I, I've got another session in, in Melbourne on Wednesday, um, more on investment strategies. And I always refer to it as lights on money. You need to know how much you need to pay the rent every month just to keep the lights on. 
those sort of elements need to be factored into your pessimistic, realistic, and, and, and optimistic planning. So the branding aspect is something I've fallen into a little bit. Because again, I'm not a marketing guy at all, actually. But one of the things about scaling, and when I looked at my, my own experience with scaling, one, one of the companies um, that, I, that I started up a while ago, we really struggled. We're not marketing guys. I'm a sales guy, actually, by trade. So I know to sell, but I don't know how to market. And we're, in a, long, we're a long way away from the action of the industry we were targeting. So it was really tough. We couldn't, we couldn't spend the money needed. We couldn't justify the money needed to really get that big brand out. And we also saw that too many companies were doing product pushes on LinkedIn and, and, and other social media networks. So we decided instead to go with this whole big thought leadership play, which meant we aligned with associations and different trade shows and speaking slots in the given sector that we were targeting. And we honed in specifically on really Level, offering a level of expertise in that sector, not talking about product at all, never talked about product, never even mentioned our product. And what we were able to achieve over six months to eight months was you started to build a bit of a groundswell. People started to take, pay a bit more interest in what you were saying when you posted, when you were speaking, when you were part of the panel, so that your brand started actually adding to the brand quality of your product without ever promoting the product. And it, it takes a, a long time, actually. It took us a while. But we're able to get there in a much more, we're able to get, add a level of premium to our, to our product rather than just pushing the product down people's throat. Kerry mentioned before about COVID. COVID was the worst thing possible for inbound outbound. Inbound outbound is, is a dead, almost a dead industry now. You know, the whole spam emails. Target, even targeted emails, because no one was face-to-face. -face. So the only option they had was LinkedIn messages, Facebook messages, whatever social media you're on, Twitter feeds. So people are now disillusioned with the whole thing. They don't want to get another message. I'm getting 10 a day, 15 a day. You've got to get smarter. So we looked at how do we avoid that spam aspect and really create a, a, a brand presence by actually having something to say which is worth value. So this whole thing is about, in this context of scaling, is if you do that well, your own, your, your own brand and your own posting, et cetera, has a direct impact on your company. And that doesn't cost a lot of money to do. So I, I take it pretty seriously now, even though I, I stopped a bit early on. It's worked. It's worked really, really well, and it continues to work. I'm not a big fan of product push. Don't think that works. It's also an opportunity to reflect that you are um, growing the company, that you're progressive, that you're out there. Um, it's interesting. I know there's a Ballarat firm that are, are building new premises and they're always showing the build, you know, how it's progressing. It's a confectionery co company and I've got no interest in a confectionery company, but just when I hear their name now, I think they are on, they're growing, they're mm. successful because they're sharing their, their journey of yeah. building new premises um, for our benefit too, to learn from, um, you know, how they're going about it. So I think how you are just going to the latest conferences and, and being seen and asking questions and contributing is all part of your brand, your personal brand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you sort of buy into it, mm -hmm. create a level of intimacy. And the good thing about that is you become bigger than actually your ability to touch. You become, you expand your horizons much, much more, much easier, actually. Go to market's a big topic, as I said. So I won't labour the point too much, but the grand plan needs a really good go to market plan. Without, without the go to market, the grand plan, plan, grand plan can't be realised. The direct versus indirect is probably the key. I'm a massive fan, even though I'm a set of sales, sales by trade. By, by history, I think like a sales guy when I run companies. Most of my, my work is indirect because I don't want to hire people for exactly the reasons we talked about. Not that I don't like hiring salespeople. I just realise it's going to be a, a dip and it doesn't scale too well, actually. Having Hiring five, six, seven, ten salespeople around the regions, around the world, is a pretty expensive proposition. 
indirect channels is not expensive, but you need to incent. People don't love resell. Reselling your product is not what they dream of every night. The companies you align with, the companies that you identify, need to have benefit beyond the revenue they typically will generate from your product. So that it needs to complete them in some way. It needs to, it needs to add a level of loyalty to their own proposition. So indirect is a really important strategy in the context of, it, of direct as well. Now, you may be the only, only direct sales engine in your company, but there are a number of steps in go to market. You need a really good sales CRM first, because if you don't have a CRM, you don't have a source of truth. If you don't have a source of truth, you're working off sticky notes. Not a, not a great idea. Once you've got the, the, the sales CRM source of truth, then you can look at inbound, outbound, but smart. You can then link that into your own personal brand. Then you can work out direct versus indirect. So the whole thing ties together and you don't need to be a sales guru to work that out. Again, in that same, same sort of whiteboarding process. Does that all make sense, Stefan? You want to ask any questions? I'm going a bit quick. You've given you a breath. I'm, yeah. I'm being a bit Aussie with my... Uh, yeah, so I'm squid, smart. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. It, it said the go-to-market thing is... It's a whole to, it's a whole topic in its own right. It's, there's a lot of material in there to, to, to walk through. But in general terms, the whole thing... I think the key message is it's got a little link. Everything's got a link together from that grand plan down. And then you can kind of work out how to pivot best. And finally, the, the alignment... This is one which is a, a real personal thing. It's what I always try to do. Um, you're a small fish in a big pond. And there's a lot of other companies that are in the same space. That, to, to your point before, Marty, with the, with the um, lot of companies at about the same stage. The approach I try to take, doesn't always work, but I try to take, is identify which company would... I'd be able to create some sort of dependency with so that I mean much more to them than, than my size. And that's a bit convoluted. <laughs> but in essence, you're in a certain vertical. You identify companies that have a big market share of your market and you work out ways of infiltrating that company. Now, this is much more exit discussion than long-term. This is much more of a tactical play. But it's probably... Um, Better to give an example. So one of the companies that um, I've been involved in for a while is in the high-tech sector, but much more in the video domain. And there's one global market leader in this space, and they have all the content rights from all the major studios, and they distribute those con their content rights almost exclusively in certain regions. They're untouchable virtually, and they can, they can pick their technology partner from anyone in the industry. And if you're a small little company, you're not even on their radar, not even of interest. So what we did was that thought leadership, firstly, we built ourselves a bit of a presence that we had something worthwhile listen, listening to. We brought them into certain deals. And finally, we found a gap or an Achilles heel in their own technology stack, and we gave them a way out. Now, they ended up reselling us in one deal. The role of reselling us meant they fronted my company in a fairly large organization, the money didn't mean anything to them, but suddenly there was a tie-in. There was a level of dependency, which meant them made them pretty nervous about the idea of someone else potentially moving in and making a, making a play for the same company. If they did that, if a competitor moved in with that dependency, they're in trouble, basically. So even, even in, in terms of their overall market, tiny, tiny deal, but in terms of what it meant to them, large. They had a five-year commitment. If a competitor bought this company, they were in trouble. So it's an example of creating a dependency with a David and Goliath type scenario. I always try to do it. Don't always doesn't always work, but that's also very much exit based. So it's an example of aligning based on my grand plan, which was to exit in X number of years. The go-to-market was completely related to this one company. We put all the almost all the eggs in one basket to ensure we hit them at all angles. So we got technology in and we got a reseller situation and the rest sort of worked out in the favour. Doesn't always say. Okay, last slide. 
It's more an open question. Actually, there's one more slide after this. I'm, 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 I'm slightly teasing you. We talk product. We talk services. We talk software. Is there any difference in scaling? Do you see any difference between the stuff Marty was talking about, stuff Sam was talking about? You know, we, we've heard different different case studies um, across the room. What do you guys see? Any differences? Market differences? It's always differences, but it's all relatable when it goes back. And the, you know, with especially when you're like we said, money's talking to certain people outside that don't have any relation to the scale business, don't have anything like that. But it's what the core values of it are all very similar. Yep. Yep. I think the ethos is the same, actually. I think the scale the scaling things in terms of manufacturing um, will differ because you've got the physical product and things like that. But I think the, the characteristics are pretty, pretty similar, actually. Okay, this is honestly a lot of <laughs> So practicalities, define your plan. It's, it is the most important thing you can do. If you don't have a plan, you're really, you're, you're trying your luck a bit and you're using your own charisma and things like that, but that lasts only so long, trust me. Um, no one to let go. You don't have to put a date, date or a line in the sand, but know, know when your skill set starts to not paper out, but you kind of know that there's other roles which may be more the, more at the forefront of your company. Find a sounding board. I think it's been a really interesting topic in this in this conversation as well. You know, the person doesn't need to be, or people don't need to be from your sector, but they need to be have a level of trust there as well. You know, you're not going to hire the person. You you want you want them to be there because they kind of want to be there. They want to help you out individually as well as your company. And identify the skills you need, not necessarily their jobs, and be prepared to let go even there as well. They're not going to necessarily do the job the same way as you did it, and that's okay. Trust your people, identify the skills, go forth and prosper. There's my details. Yeah, the reason we put this here at the end is I really like what's happening locally. I really do. I want to help where I can, so don't hesitate to, to reach out. Have questions or, or um, just want to have, have a bit of a chat or a sounding board, always interesting. Thanks, gang. Appreciate your time. All right. Any questions before we wind yeah, up? I've got one straight off the bat, just with the grand plan, because I'm, I'm at that stage where I'm really honing in on that grand plan. Um, is it okay to change you have over to change. time? So, yeah, for example, yeah. if I want to initially, say, five-year exit plan, and then I get to four, and I realise it's going to be ten. Yep. Yeah. That, you know, that previous four years is obviously got to me got to where I'm going to be at that time, but yeah. then that whole system's going to change as such. Or... I think this little COVID thing, I'm not sure if it, if it was a thing here as well. It was pretty big <laughs> uh, and that, that taught everyone that if you can't pivot, you're in real trouble. You know, companies went under, but other companies thrived in that space because they just found gaps. They pivoted into different areas. So the whole idea of a plan is it changes. It, it evolves. Your company evolves. But it's a discipline of actually having the plan and being prepared to revisit. And you want contingencies as well. Like a strict plan where this is the only way we're going to go forward and it's my way or the highway doesn't really work. The scenarios, the scenario thinking is, is so important. You've got different scenarios, but you've got to also be able to cater for, for changes in the market. You, know, you, you might be in a market where, so I, I was in, I, give an example. I, I knew nothing about travel and tourism other than I quite like going on planes to travel on holidays. But I got involved in the sector. Great, great opportunity. High tech, um, deploying on, on planes and on, on large luxury liners, cruise liners. And we did that in 2019. Um, <laughs> and I built a really good pipeline. Yeah. Great pipeline, awesome pipeline. And then we, we had this slight, slight little blip. <laughs> the whole thing shut down. Literally, the industry shut down in three days completely. It was video tech. So what we did instead is we pivoted into web, um, into web streaming into, and into webinars because no one could do any events. So our tech would, was cloud-based, so that it, it allowed for a lot of these stadiums which were completely empty, but they still, built this, they still had the artists in the stadium and they streamed it. 
We did that. We did webcasting. We did that for the year and a half until things picked up. Kept the lights on with that money. Actually did okay during the period. And then, but but didn't give up on the sector. And that was probably a good lesson for a really impatient character like me. We kept at it. We kept contact with the key con- with the key customers. How are you doing? You know, tough time for all this, all lots of this stuff. And the net result of that is we closed about five five major deals at the back end of COVID. Right at the when started, things started picking up. By the way, I've got some bad stories as well. <laughs> I'm telling you the good stories, but it was a it was a, a good case of grand plan. We got vertical. We got to pivot quick. If we, if we don't pivot quick, we're we're out of business. But also not losing sight of the original plan, which was we think the sector's got a gap. We've identified the gap, and we're going to basically plug away. So people do like loyalty. They don't like hard and fast sales sales approaches. We were talking about the the pitching and the product push and stuff like that. It's done. It's done. It's it's so. It's it, it, there's no sense in it. There's no thinking in it. There's no strategy in it. Just change it up. And also that caution. I mean, COVID aside, you no company can afford to be complacent. Look look how much technology changes in a five year period, maybe a two year period, um, and if you're not constantly revisiting. And, and are we still relevant? Are we delivering? Are there different ways, better ways of doing it? You've just got to keep revisiting in that respect too. What is happening around you in a, a global sense? So, um, and those that are ready to adapt and change, they do really well out of it. Mm. The others get left behind. Would you say, yeah, so look at our plan, our goal's always been the same. Probably more the way we get there. Mm. Yeah, it's well said, actually. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting excited. <laughs> have we got a question? We on the, oh, they um, they will directly message me, so I don't guess would have come up from there. Um, this person missed the first half of the session, so they, they may start again. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> start again. Um, are there any templates or guide documents for working out the grand plan of scaling? Yeah, look, there are. If you if you if you search on any of this sort of stuff online, there's a there's a whole raft of different doc- documentation and and templates. Um, I I leverage templates sometimes, but when it comes to these sort of things, I just kind of do it my, do it in my own way because I've got a certain way of looking at life. Um, so I've got yes, quasi templates myself that I, I use, uh, but there's a lot of stuff online as well. There's a lot of there's a lot of resource on on. Scaling and all sorts of things. The only caution I would I would I would um, offer is you don't want to make it so generic that it becomes theoretical. You you need it to to live actually these these things. So that's why I always preface that the stuff I'm talking about here is my own experience. It's not taken from you know from a template and those sort of things. But there are definitely resources available. And and I'd add that a lot of people in this room and online have actually been participating. It was interesting, Marty's now on to another element of learning through the Accelerator. So uh, participate in an Accelerator program or pre-Accelerator programs coming up <laughs> next year through Startup Centre Victoria. Um, you know, often that provides a framework, you know, yeah, and, and week by week we had these discussions that were helping to form a framework and um, help prepare you to make the decisions mm. that you need to do. But, um, yes, it's a very organic type of learning, isn't it? And uh, not uh, but, too prescriptive. No, but it's a really good point. Uh, the, some of the people involved that I've that been mentors in the accelerators that I've also been mentors in are really smart. They, they really they have frameworks. They, they're much more... Operational than I am. <laughs> so there are definitely people out there that can leverage for sure. Mm. And and surrounding it, not necessarily one mentor. Um, you know, I've heard people say they pick three very different types of mentors mm. that they use in different ways. So all bring different perspectives, skill sets to um, you know you can bounce your ideas mm. off and um, and and definitely sometimes. Uh, totally outside your sector mm. with a, a different um, way of thinking. So mentors are definitely a great way um, of going forward and, and that's something that we'll be continuing through Startup Centre Victoria 
as well and bringing back some of you people with your learn learnings of what you know how you deal with this transition so that will be really useful for future startups um, and the pitfalls to avoid and how you manage that scale up transition so i think we can probably um you know call the session to an end thank you everyone for being online um most importantly Thank you, Andrew. It is so lovely to have you here in the room after having talked to you on a screen for the past 12 months. Yes. And uh, and Lauren, as always, for helping in the background, La Trobe. And um, thank you, everyone. And um, we'll see you next year. Stay tuned for more exciting events like this. Thank you.